Well, good morning, church. It is, uh, it's just a tremendous joy to stand in front of you all. Every time I do, the first thing I want to say is how much I love you. Uh, I haven't been in this service uh, before. I always go to second service, so it's a joy to be with you. I, I just, there's a lot of folks here that I haven't seen for a long time, and I miss that. I really do. So thank you for spending time today as a church family. Um, <clears throat> turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. And while you do that, uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, um, I'm, on, uh, I'm, I'm the senior staff member, not the senior pastor. I'm an associate pastor here at Bethany Community, have been since, since January last year, and uh, it's been a great joy to serve in that way. Janelle and I have served in the Ministry of Biblical Counseling for the last, uh, well, since 1999, and through that process, uh, and my experience in that, is uh, what prompted me to choose this particular text today. You see, for those, for those particular years, a majority of what I've done has been to minister to, uh, to, to women, single women in particular, and it's been a, a great joy, but along with that, it's, it, there's a tremendous heartache in walking with people who suffer, regardless of who they are. My desire here today is to help you see what I have seen in personal, um, in my own personal life, what I've seen with actual uh, people who have, I've watched walk through trials in their lives. Today, uh, today's going to be a little different than what you're used to, obviously. Uh, I'm a teacher more than a preacher, and so you look at your notes and you panic. Uh, please don't. But I want to tell you this. My goal here is to help you see the power that's in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. In fact, just in the last two weeks, I've talked personally to six or five different people who I believe have embraced the truths that we're going to talk about today, and I've watched them go through some intense difficulties, and I have seen them receive the two promises that we're going to talk about today, the peace of God guarding their hearts and the God of peace with them. And my, my passion here today is that you would take what you hear and do something with it so this would be real in your life as well. This, if you take what we share today, not because I'm sharing it, but because of the truth that we're going to share, if you take this and do something with it, it will change your life. And it's with that passion that I want uh, <clears throat> to have you, uh, well, I, I forgot this. We're going to do something new today, uh, as if we haven't done enough. In the back of your sheet, there's a couple QR scans. I want to tell you this, that we're not going to get through this passage the way I would like. There's just, fa fr frankly, too much material. So my goal here is I, I want to talk about this passage in a helicopter view. I want you to get the lay of the land and the sense of it. And my hope is that you will look at the, uh, the two documents that we put on the website and do something with this in your care groups, in your families, in your personal quiet time, um, there's two documents that will help you summarize and then go deeper uh, what we talk about here today. I'm convinced, because it's God's Word, I'm convinced it will change your life, but I have personally come face to face with five people that have talked to me in the last two weeks that have talked about amazing transformation that they have experienced because of the truths of this passage So let's, uh, let's turn to Philippians chapter 4, and uh, please stand with me in awe of God's Word. I'm reading from the ESV, Rejoice in the Lord always, Paul writes, and again I say rejoice, let your reasonableness be known to everyone, the Lord is at hand, do not be anxious about anything. 
but in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Please be seated. Let's pray. Father God, you are, you are awesome, you are mighty, you are holy, you are majestic, and you are sovereign, and you transcend everything, and yet you are a God who is near. You're a God who cares. You're a God who hurts with us. You're a God who hears our thoughts, you know our hearts, you still love us. We're amazed by that, and for this we praise you and give you worship. We thank you for the privilege of being here today. We ask you to bless us as we turn uh, into your word and look to see how, how what you say to us might help us see you and know you better. We pray for Pastor Daniel and Whitney and the kiddos as they travel uh, to Texas and as uh, Pastor and Rich uh, travel to South Africa. Lord, we're we're excited about that. We pray your protection on them. And we pray that there would be eternal blessing as a result of what they do in the next days. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We'll give you the context of what this letter is all about. Paul writes to the Philippian church from a Roman prison. He's been there for four years. You remember, Paul has been through, you can turn that off. I will stay in the, I will stay here. <laughs> There's enough white up here. You don't need more. <clears throat> he is writing to this church that he loves dearly, dearly beloved. He says, I long for them. I, you, think, you think about his love for this church. It, I just love uh, Apostle Paul. He's my, favorite, uh, he's my favorite person in all of Scripture apart from our Jesus. He writes to them. He sends Epaphroditus there to, to, uh, to deliver the letter, and his desire is to encourage this church. You know why? Because they were discouraged. They loved Paul. They knew Paul was in trouble. They knew Paul was in prison. They, they knew Epaphroditus was uh, near death. He almost died. They themselves were suffering. Uh, there was seven times in this letter Paul talks about disunity in this church, and he encourages them. And the overall picture uh, of, this, of this letter, we read in, uh, in chapter 1. If you want to flip there, you can go one page. He says this to them, and I want you to get the big picture theme for this so you understand where chapter 4 lands in the process. Paul says to his beloved church, live in a, in a way that's worthy of the gospel. I want you all to live like you are called to live. He doesn't tell them, I want you to be relieved of suffering. He says, I want you to live according to the gospel, verse 27, and stand firm in one spirit, one mind, striving side by side. Don't be fussing. Don't be fussing. Stand strong together for the gospel. Not frightened. And that's where we're going today is what we do with fear and worry when things don't go well. Most of us end up in that ditch. Don't be frightened. In anything. By the way, the word frightened is talking about a spooked horse. That's the kind, we get jittery, don't we? You hurt me, I jump back. He's warning them, stand firm. Chapter 3, he says, rejoice in the Lord. 30 some, 35 times in this book, he, he talks about rejoicing and comfort and confidence. And this guy is wound up and wowed by the gospel. And he wants them to get it. And so chapter 4, he gives them very practical uh, closing thoughts in this letter of how they can stand firm in the Lord. And that's where we're at today. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. The theme here, point number one, is don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Stand firm 
in the Lord by rejoicing. Rejoice. He commands them, God commands us to rejoice even though life is hard. And this, in this context, rejoice is a present tense ongoing verb. My freshman English teacher would be shocked to hear me talk like that. A lifestyle of rejoicing. Now, here's what we do. Normally, what, what unrenewed thinking does in a believer is we look at our suffering, we see the pain, we don't like it, and we focus on what's not going well, and more and more and more, we look at what's not going. We look at where God isn't. Look at me. I cannot see you. Paul says, look up, stand firm in the Lord, in the Lord, in the Lord. See the Lord. Don't see your problems. Don't ignore them, but see God in them. <clears throat> now, how do you do that? Well, all of the scripture talks to you about Jesus, but let me just, just sit tight and listen. Here's a, several things he is saying in this letter of why we ought to rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 1, we're saints. We are partners in the gospel. He that began a good work in you is going to complete it. It has been granted to you. Think about this. It has been granted to you that you believe. Have you realized if you're saved, that the faith you have to come to the cross is a gift itself. You don't just conjure up belief without God giving it to you. That is something to rejoice in, you see. God is at work, chapter 2. And what does he do? He gives you the want to, to obey him. You realize that you don't have to have your faith. He gives it to you. You realize when you don't have desire, Paul says rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because God gives you the desire to serve him. And then it says, chapter 2, verse 13, give you the will, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Is that not reason to rejoice, even though I have this and it's not going away? Chapter 3, we are the circumcision. We worship God by the Spirit of God. We have no confidence in the flesh. He takes all of his fleshly confidence and throws it aside and says, I want to know Christ and I want to be in Christ. Christ has made me his own. Imagine, Christ has called you, if you're a believer, and made you his own. Tell me that's not reason to rejoice, even though your life is falling apart. We have heavenly citizenship. We're waiting for a Savior who's going to come and get us. What's he going to do? Transform this lowly body. Awesome. I can't wait. Because mine's falling apart. Stand firm in what God is doing. Listen, in you, in you, in you. Point number one, don't be discouraged. Stand firm in the Lord by rejoicing in Him. And I would, I would encourage you to be spending lots of time as a routine, a lifestyle, thinking about why you ought to rejoice. Point number two, <clears throat> let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Don't be difficult in personal relationships, let your reasonableness uh, be known. In other words, you need to be a reasonable witness. That's, that's what I'm asking you to think about here. Paul says, don't be fussing with each other. In a couple of verses, he talks about Euodius and Syntyche uh, and tells them to get along. Don't be fussing. Be a reasonable witness. And I, I chose the word witness for a reason, because he says here, let your reasonableness be known to what? To whom? All. To everyone. So here's the question. Would people, uh, all the people that you know, including, including the, uh, the clerk at Walmart, including the guy that uh, uh, scoops his snow in your driveway, would you be known as a reasonable person. Now, what's that mean, to be reasonable? Well, there's not enough English words to describe it. Literally, there's no, no way to interpret the, uh, the word accurately, so there's a bunch of words. Here's a few. Big-heartedness, non-retaliatory spirit. How about this, meekness? And that's a, that's a whole class on meekness, graciousness. Literally, it, it means 
let your gentle, forbearing spirit be known to everybody. Don't be difficult. Be a reasonable witness. There was a, I read an article several years ago about a man who uh, uh, his, his lifestyle was to play cards with his friends. So on the weekends, he would be gone, leave his wife alone, excuse me, and he would spend time <clears throat> drinking and playing cards with his friends. One night, <clears throat> it was getting late, the guys were getting drunk, and the, the men started to complain about their wives. And he spoke up, and he says, not my wife, you ought to meet my wife. She is the most gracious, kind, caring, gentle person you could ever know. In fact, we could go home right now, I could wake her up, and she'd make us all breakfast. <clears throat> and what, are they, what do you think they did? They called his bluff. So now it's two-ish in the morning, and they, they, all these guys, these four or five guys, show up at his house. He goes upstairs, wakes her up, gets her out of bed, and he says, make us breakfast, we're hungry. Now you can imagine what that would sound like, and uh, tell me, what would you do? Right? <clears throat> Either that or this. You know what she did? She got up. She never complained. She cheerfully went downstairs and she fed those people until they were satisfied and did it graciously. She went back to bed, never said a word. Three weeks later, one of those guys came to her and said, how? How did you do that? Tell me. Tell me what makes you different. And he came to Jesus because of her sweet, reasonable witness. Praise God. And you know, two weeks later, her husband followed him and came to Christ. Point number two, don't be fussing. Don't be difficult. Be reasonable. Verse number five, <clears throat> let your gentle, forbearing spirit be known to all men. <clears throat> now, here's what, here's what I want you to think about. Uh, the Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. What does that mean? Some people say that Paul's referring to uh, future coming, that in the future he's coming, and it's, it could be near. Well, he talks about it 10 times in this, in this letter that God's coming back, that Christ is coming. But I would argue that it, he is literally saying the Lord is this kind of near, like this kind of near. Be reasonable and know your, your behavior would be different if he was that close, right? <clears throat> you would also be a lot more comforted and focused if he was that close to you. Point number three. <clears throat> Don't be divided in your mind. Stand firm in the Lord with thankful requests. Don't be anxious for anything. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to men. So here's, you hear us talking about this often. Here's the put off. Stop worrying. Here's the put on. Pray, supplication, give thanks, and make requests. See the difference? Now, <clears throat> I'm going to challenge you to understand that if, if you in, it, choose to continue this way, don't turn the light on, you are going to end up going darker and darker and darker into worry. And you're going to be caught by that sin. It's a sin. And a lot of us, we talk about worry as though, as though it's, uh, it's just part of breathing. It's like breathing. He says, don't do it. Pray. What is he saying? Jesus said that same thing. Don't be anxious, right? Matthew 6, uh, I think it's six times in Matthew 6, Jesus says, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. You know why? You know why? Why did Jesus say, don't be anxious? Because your heavenly Father knows 
what you need. And to choose this, to choose this way, is to say your father doesn't know, he doesn't care, or he's unable. You see, worry is an affront to the character of God. And all of us struggle with it. Um, when we were first married, um, I, I, I still don't like to be alone, home alone. Uh, and I don't mind being alone. I just don't like to be home alone without Janelle. I lived or worked about a half mile away from, uh, from home. I would actually drive in the driveway. If she's not home, I'd go back, go back to work. So when she's late, guess what I do? What am I going to do if God takes her? That's the, usually the first thought that comes to my mind. Now, I've learned, uh, I've learned that if God takes her, he wants her, and I'm not going to fuss with him. I've rested in that, but it's still the first thought, because I don't want, I don't want to be without her. But worry is a sin, because it fails to see that God is sovereign, he is good, he is holy. you imagine if Satan were sovereign? Can you imagine? God's sovereignty means nothing unless he is also good and loving and kind and faithful, true? Worry says God is not all those things about him. In fact, Christian worries, a Christian worrier is an oxymoron, isn't it? It's like flaming snow, snowflakes, jumbo, jumbo shrimp. How about stationary orbit? Christian worrier. Same idea. Put off worry, start praying. Now, what does that mean to pray? <clears throat> Literally, I believe, I believe. What God is wanting us to do is to arrest our path towards worry, plant a foot in faith, and turn and understand I need God. Pray, prayer here in this text, I believe, means to understand your need to ask God and understand that God is asking you to come to him. That's one. Supplication is this. Literally, it is to make a list and tell him what your need is. And then let your request known is like this. I come and I believe that there's a God who's going to do something about what I leave here. And then with thanksgiving, you accept what he's going to do with what you ask him to do. And you tell him I'm okay, however you ask or answer my prayer. That, I believe, is what this means. <clears throat> George Mueller is a great example of this. Here's a man who was running a, an orphanage and had no money, never asked for money. He only asked God for money. And you, you, some of you are nodding. You know the story. They, he sits his boys down and he prays with no food. He thanks God and he asks God. And while they're praying, a milk truck had broken down in front of his orphanage. And a guy brings in milk and it says, it'll spoil, do you need milk? And a baker came by and gave him enough bread at the same time to feed those, those children. That's what I believe uh, point number three is talking about. Don't be divided in your mind. Don't be fussing over what God's going to do or not going to do. Pray and trust him and then be okay with how he responds to what you have to, <clears throat> to ask of him, you see. Verse 7, <clears throat> if we pray and if we obey, verses 4 and 5, here's a promise. Here's a promise. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Here's a promise. You won't be disturbed. It's not don't, you won't. I, I didn't uh, uh, make that I should have made that change. There's a promise here. Paul talks about this promise in every letter he writes. It's all over his heart. Romans 8, he says, to set the mind on the flesh, look at me, to set the mind on the flesh is what? Death. But to set your mind on the spirit is life and peace. So, peace guards. What does it mean to guard? Excuse me. Literally, the word here is garrison. Reminds me of uh, my cousin was in Vietnam, 
1966. And he, uh, <clears throat> one night they were out on, they'd been out for weeks in the jungle doing uh, reconnaissance type things. And one night they were, uh, they were set up in the jungle and he and a couple of other guys were surrounding their camp watching uh, as a guard, garrison as a guard. The l word here he uses lit is literally a, um, a word for soldier. So here they were, and they were looking through the night goggles, and they, they saw Viet Cong troops sneaking up on their compound. And they called in mortars and took out the whole lot of them. And that's what God promises you if you choose to stop going this way, and if you choose to turn towards him, he promises that his peace, like troops, will come around your heart and guard you. The peace of God guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And by the way, heart and mind is not, they're not distinct. We think this way, mind and heart, it's not distinct in Scripture. Heart and mind are the same. It's just two different words, a way to talk about your inner man, your worship center, you see. Verse 8. Finally, <clears throat> brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Look at me. Anything worthy of praise this way? Tell me, say it. No. And he is saying, okay, let's, let's turn the corner now. You have prayed. You have prayed. You have the, com the comfort and promise of peace. Now it's time to get your mind engaged. You've got to do something. If you look at this book, the book of Philippians, you will realize just how much Paul is trying to go after their minds. Stand in the Lord means that your mind is engaged constantly. He talks more about the mind in this book than he does in all of his other letters combined. Point number four, don't be disturbed. <clears throat> I, just, I just said that. I'm sorry. Point number four. You can't even tell I'm a teacher, can you? Point number four, don't be disturbed. Stand firm in the Lord, protected by the peace of God. <clears throat> let's move on number five don't be distracted stand firm <clears throat> stand firm with righteous thinking stand firm in the lord with righteous thinking what he's calling us to do in verse eight is to think about what's true honorable pure just lovely good report virtue and praise make sure you're thinking about that but this is the way we tend to go our minds go to default unrenewed minds end up over here right so what's this what's true <clears throat> obviously we don't have time to unpack this in fact uh, as i have looked at this this passage of scripture i would probably preach through it after this session four to six more times uh, so um, just understand, this is only helicopter view. But I want to talk about this in summary. Verse 8 is to think about what's true. Now tell me, tell me, according to Scripture, what is true? His Word. Correct? He says... And Psalm 119, 163 through 165, you ought to write this down. I want you to look it up later. Uh, I quote this often. 163 says, I hate and abhor falsehood. Look at me. I hate and abhor falsehood. You see, I hate this way. I don't know who wrote Psalm 119. Um, my guess is, is Daniel. Um, no one knows but I sure like the way he thinks. I love your law. I hate this way. I love your law. Standing firm in the Lord, if we love our, the law, look at, look at this. We're going to keep looking up beyond our difficulties. True? 
164, seven times a day, I praise you for your righteous rules. This man is focused on doing, verse 8. And 165, great peace have those who love thy law, and nothing shall make them stumble. See, he got it. He understands the, the power and the principle of what we're talking about today. Isaiah 26 says, you will keep him in perfect peace. Uh, him whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Psalm, or Isaiah 26, 3 is, is also, t- now the point here is, think about what's true. Psalm 119, 163 through 165 tells us what's true is what's, what is God's word. Psalm, uh, John 17, 17, thy word is truth. That's one focus. If you're going to do uh, verse 8, you're going to focus on God's word. But you know, I know an awful lot of people that know a lot about the Bible, they're focused on the Bible, not the person who wrote it. And so I want to encourage you, some of the people that are most difficult to get them to see how God wants them to think differently and change, those kind of people are the ones that know the Bible the most. In fact, one time, one conversation I had with someone, um, and, and it'll sound hurtful, trust me, it wasn't, In the context, I said, you know what I think your problem is? is I think you know too much about God's Word. And I want to challenge each one of you that if we're going to think about what is true, we need to think about what's in Scripture, yes. But Isaiah says, great peace have they, no, it's you, look at me, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You see? Verse 8 is not just talking about the words on the page. It's talking about the person that wrote them. And if we are going to stand against worry, if we are going to stand firm in the Lord, rejoicing, we're going to be connected with him, you see. It's more than words on the page. And this has been my, uh, my default in years past. I loved apologetics. I loved the study of the Scripture. I loved the intellectual part. And I missed him. I missed him. And Paul is saying, rejoice in Jesus. Stand firm in the Lord. Daniel has been telling us to live in light of the future, right? This is how you do it. And every time we have a communion, we celebrate a Jesus who dealt with our past, who lives with us right here, right here in the present, and he's coming in the future, you see? That's how, that's this in the Lord kind of thinking. So, God calls us to be in the Lord, and he tells us that he will change us in four dimensions, the four dimensions that we live in. Do you realize you're a four-dimensional person? <clears throat> First dimension is your relationship with God, vertical. Second dimension is your internal thoughts. You preach to, Do you realize you preach to yourself more than anybody else does? Vertical, internal. You have horizontal relationships with other people. And then there's external. You have to deal with the weather. <clears throat> you have to deal with living in Illinois, when I'd so much rather be a voice crying in the wilderness. Four dimensions, and he tells us that when we think truth in about and in all four dimensions, he will not only protect us, point number six, uh, Verse 9, verse 9. I apologize. Don't disobey. Stand firm in the Lord in righteous obedience. I got ahead of myself. You keep him in perfect peace in four dimensions as we think about what is true and honorable and just and pure and lovely and commendable. And by the way, in your notes, 
there's a, uh, uh, there's a QR scan where you can uh, learn more about how to walk through this whole idea. There's a chart in there to help you think intentionally on how to do this. I encourage you to, to spend some time and look at that. <clears throat> Don't be distracted. Stand firm in the Lord with righteous thinking. <clears throat> I see here. Um, the next point. Point number six, don't disobey, stand firm in the Lord in righteous obedience. What you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. Now Paul goes from, he goes from rejoicing to being reasonable, to right praying, now to the promise of peace, right thinking, and then he says, now do, do, do. You've, you've learned You've received, you've seen, you've heard, do it. So what he's, he's counting on is he's lived life with these people. Paul is a discipler, and he's done it well. He's taught them, they learned it. He showed them, they saw it, you see. But I want you to think about this. You can listen and listen and listen and listen and never receive. They did. And that's what makes a disciple Acts uh, 17, 11, the, the Bereans were more noble than the, those in Thessalonica. Um, why? Because they received the word with readiness. They were glad to hear it, and they chose to obey it, you see. This church is committed to discipling. We need to be a discipling church, and we need to be discipled. <clears throat> Don't disobey Stand firm in the Lord in righteous obedience. Verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. Point number 7, don't be distracted. You won't be distracted. Why? Because you're standing in the presence of the God of peace. Here's the promise, the God of peace. Now I want to encourage you to think about this. <clears throat> as you look at that handout, as you look about at this, your handwritten words, are the keys to walking and standing firm in the Lord. And you can take this a lot further if you spend some time with the notes that we have on our website. Now, four dimensions. Rejoicing, that's internal and vertical. Reasonable, that's internal and horizontal, right? Thankful requests, that's internal that's vertical, and you can also request about horizontal and environmental kinds of things, true? External things, you can. You see, this, is, this touches you in every aspect of your life. And as you choose righteous thinking and righteous obedience, again, all four dimensions play out as you live out the gospel, which is why Paul wrote the letter, worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now, I don't know where you're at uh, in life. I know one thing, when I walk into this church, my habit is to look around. My habit is to think, I know my heart hurts. Their heart must hurt. I wonder how I can help them. You might have a, a tremendous burden, one that you wouldn't even tell anyone. It's so bad, so difficult. I want to leave you with this story. Two weeks ago, um, Heather and I were in a a, a class that talked about how to help women who have been traumatized. And I share this public testimony. Bridget, a victim of domestic violence, sold by her parents for profit for a number of years. And here's how she handled it. She went through so much trauma, this is the road she went down. She wasn't grounded. She didn't have people around her to help her. She avoided, she was so afraid. She avoided eye contact with anyone. She wouldn't let men touch her. She didn't know why. She just knew that something was unsafe about it. At nighttime when she slept, they, they duct taped oven gloves on her fingers and on her hands so she wouldn't harm herself in the nightmares and the flashbacks at night and during also during her uh, nap times. That's how she struggled with being sinned against. 
how does this passage help her? Here's her testimony. I quote, Through this suffering, I came to the conclusion that God is good and does only good. He was affectionately sovereign in ordaining the abuse I went through in order to bring me to himself. Look at me. She did this. She looked up. She changed the way she thought. She became thankful and praised him instead of uh, worrying. He had to strip me of my independence, which caused me to run to him, to be embraced in his everlasting arms. His grace is truly sufficient for every circumstance. My God is a warrior fighting at my side. His arms are always around me, shielding me from the enemy. He goes before me, making a pathway so I should be strong and courageous, end quote. That is amazing grace. That is why we rejoice in the Lord, and that is why we have hope to stand firm in wherever we are as well. And today, she says, lastly, I stand ready to forgive my parents if they ever ask. That can be your experience as well. Let's pray. Oh God, we, we love you. Your grace is stunning when it's juxtaposed with so much evil and hardship and heartache. Lord, we thank you that uh, you have given us this kind of revelation to understand who you are and to help us live in relation, right relation with you. We ask your blessing on your word and pray that as we leave this place that we would choose to do something with it, that we might be changed and that we might be more effective in your kingdom. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.